Have you guys ever thought about what your first ever phobia was? Or some of your biggest phobias? Well, mine is this. The sight of this would just make me scream and run away. There have been instances where I have not used the bathroom because a lizard was there. People make fun of me all the time because of this. Because they think it is silly. To my surprise, I came across content on the internet where people were having lizards as pets. Came across such cute pictures of these lizards. I wouldn't say my fear is gone, but I think I can tolerate them better now. I think you guys have an idea of what we are going to discuss in this video. The creepy crawlies on earth, reptiles. Reptiles came from tetrapod vertebrate ancestors. Tetrapod because they have four limbs. We already learned about amphibians in a previous video. They are also tetrapod vertebrates. There is another group which originated from them called as amniotes. Amniotes are nothing but a group of animals that have amnion within their eggs. Amnion is the protective structure around the embryo. The early amniotes diverged into two major animals. First were the mammals and then we have the reptile evolution. I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that dinosaurs were also reptiles. They were huge, scary reptiles, but they became extinct long time back. The surprise addition here would be birds. Did you know birds and dinosaurs have the similar ancestors? Turtles were the first reptiles to evolve, followed by crocodiles, tuataras, and finally the lizards and snakes. Reptiles are true land vertebrates. But what made them so? I can think of four main characters that the reptiles had evolved which allowed them to populate land. The first one is locomotion. The name reptile itself has a Latin root. Repair or reptum. It means to creep or to crawl. The difference between creeping and crawling is that when your body touches the ground and you move on the surface, it's called as creeping. But if you use your hands to push the body off the floor and the movement is mostly supported by your limbs, then it is called as crawling. Amphibians also had limbs, right? But how do you think are reptiles better than them? Well, let's compare the way the limbs are constructed. So this is the limb sprawl meaning distance between the limbs. This particular distance uh, controls how high your body is from the ground. So this is how an amphibian would look. We can see that the limbs are uh, attached to the body more towards the side. And uh, what happens is this wouldn't support the body enough. Now look at how the reptiles are designed. We see the legs are more below the body. What this does is that it gives a lot of height um, to the animal from the floor. At the same time, this supports the body weight better. So because the body weight is supported better, their locomotion is more efficient than amphibians. The next feature is their skin. The reptilian body is covered by dry and cornified skin. So dry and cornified skin. Cornified meaning they have become hard and they formed a thick layer. And the cells are usually dead cells. In humans, reptile-like skin is a skin condition called as ichthyosis. But humans have special glands in their skin to keep the skin moisturized. Reptilian skins have keratinous epidermal structures called as cutes. These are plate-like structures. The other ones are the folds on skin and they are called as scales. Both these have keratin protein as well as waxy lipids. 
The skin of the reptiles is designed in a way to minimize water loss from the body. This is how the scales would look in a close up. The snakes and lizards shed their scales. This is to accommodate the growth of these organisms and to get rid of any parasites that they might have on their body surface. The process is called as molting. In lizards, this can happen bit by bit, meaning not the entire body would um, molt off at one go. But snakes usually do that. When they get rid of their skin, they shed their entire skin. This is the dermis and epidermis of the reptilian skin. Dermis is where there are blood connections. Epidermis is usually the protective multi-layered structure. For comparison, this is how a human skin would look. For comparison, this is how human skin looks. We have the dermis and the epidermis as well. On top, there is a layer called as stratum corneum. This layer harbors dead skin cells. Humans too have a similar layer. You can see the epidermis has folded in reptiles and that folding is what gives rise to the scales that you see on the right. The basement membrane is the separation between the dermis and the epidermis. Above this layer, we have another layer called as stratum germinativum. This is where new skin cells are produced. Most reptiles have double layer of epidermis. We have the outer layer and the inner layer as well. And when the skin is shed, the outer layer is the one which usually falls off. The inner layer contains the stratum germinativum. Therefore, it produces more cells and replaces the layers that were lost. The third feature which has allowed them to walk on land is the way they breathe. Reptiles are more active than amphibians, so therefore they need more oxygen as well. The reptilian skin cannot breathe because it's covered with dry scaly skin. Reptiles breathe via lungs. There is a nostril, oral cavity, trachea and the lungs. The lungs of the reptiles are proportionately much larger in the surface area than those of the amphibians. Reptiles can have a single lung or they can have two lungs as well. If you look at the pattern of breathing in reptiles, they don't breathe continuously. There is usually a period of active breathing and then these are followed by pauses. Lizards and snakes use muscles on the chest wall for breathing purpose. But there is an interesting twist here. The lizards also use the same muscles for running. So, lizards have to hold their breath when they run. Crocodiles and alligators, they have a sheet of muscle below their lungs called as diaphragm. The same that is present in mammals and humans. And it controls the breathing process. Most reptiles have a three-chambered heart. There is an incomplete septum in the ventricle which causes an incomplete double circulation similar to that of amphibians. So we have blood coming into the ventricle from the left and the right atrium. And due to the incomplete septum present in the ventricles, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mix to produce mixed blood. From the right ventricle, the mixed blood then makes its way into the lungs for oxygenation. Simultaneously, from the left ventricle, the mixed blood goes to the body of the organisms so that cells can utilize whatever oxygen is being supplied. Deoxygenated blood again reaches back to the heart, enters it via the right auricle. Oxygenated blood from the lungs enter into the heart via left auricle. But there is an exception to this, which is crocodile. Crocodiles have four-chambered heart. Fourth and final adaptation are various aspects of their reproduction. Most reptiles reproduce sexually and have internal fertilization, which means the male deposits the sperm into the female cloaca or reproductive tract. Cloaca. Amphibians also possess a cloaca. 
Internal fertilization is one way to ensure that the sperms reach the ovum. Most male reptiles have two sex organs which are called as hemipenes. They are usually inside the body and they are averted only just before mating. So this you see in case of snakes and these are the ones present in lizards. Reptiles can lay eggs, therefore they are oviparous. Once the egg is fertilized within the cloaca, it undergoes some special changes on its surface. Reptilian eggs have a leathery shell. Leathery shells are flexible and semi-permeable. It allows for gaseous exchange but at the same time, it protects the embryo as well. The eggs can be laid anywhere. This is a huge advantage over the eggs that are laid by amphibians. Now, let's look at this special egg which is the amniotic egg. The outermost layer is the eggshell. Um, it is to protect the embryo as well as facilitating gaseous exchange. Just within the eggshell, we have a protein which is albumin. It supplies water and proteins to the embryo. Next, we have the chorion. It is a layer within the albumin but surrounding the embryo. It also allows for gaseous exchange. And this is how the embryo looks within the egg. The embryo is surrounded by amnion. It protects the embryo from dehydrating. Yolk sac is a structure which is around the embryo and it possesses yolk. Yolk is the nutritious material that is within the egg for feeding the embryo. And finally, the additional structure called allantois is also present. It helps in nitrogen waste removal during the embryonic development. And at last, we see this airspace here within the egg, right? This airspace holds the air pocket that will be breathed in by the fully developed embryo just before it steps out of the um, egg. These additional features in the egg ensures that reptiles are completely independent from water for reproduction. Unlike amphibians, reptiles do not have a larval stage. The reason they don't have a larval stage is because of the amniotic eggs. It provides protection and enough nutrition for the embryo to reach maximum growth before it steps out. Such sort of a development is called as direct development. Reptiles do not have an external ear opening, but similar to amphibians, they have a tympanum present. Reptiles are cold blooded organisms. They have no internal metabolic mechanisms for maintaining their body temperature. They have to rely on external environment and therefore they show specific behaviors to regulate the temperature. So imagine on the outside, this is a desert and this is like a small sand dune. There is a lizard near it and it is midday. The sun is out. It's very hot. In order to avoid the sun, the lizard would initially move to the shade part of the sand dune. But after some time, it starts to realize that its body is cooling down. Now it has to increase the body temperature. So it would move to a part of the dune where it directly faces the sun. This increases the body temperature of the lizard. Now let's look at some examples of reptiles. We have tortoise and turtle. Tortoise lives on the land, but turtle lives in water. We have a crocodile as well. The largest crocodile in India is about 23 feet long. We don't have alligators, but instead of alligators, we have Indian gharials. We have tree lizards, chameleon, garden lizards, calotes, and wall lizard. Reptiles also have very, very poisonous snakes. So there is cobra, viper, and crate. There is one organism I didn't show you because we don't have their species in our country, which is Twatara.